is wonderful to be here with you. And uh, as Pastor said, we uh, have been serving with uh, Word of Life uh, in Brazil for um, 30 years now. We've been with Word of Life. We've been in Brazil for 28 of those. And uh, we're excited to be here and be able to share a little bit of what God is doing. Our ministry is called the Amazon Project. The Amazon Project is a ministry designed to reach the, the Amazon region of northern Brazil with the gospel. There are over 30,000 communities spread throughout the Amazon region uh, that have yet to been reached with the gospel. There's small pockets of people, maybe 30 or a couple hundred people live in these communities. So how do you reach uh, that many communities uh, spread through a geographical area that is equivalent of about half of the continental United States? Uh, our answer to that question is the Amazon Project. It's a ministry that starts with evangelizing and discipling young people through various means that you're familiar with the, as a church that is Word of Life clubs in here. And we have the camps and the clubs and schools and all different things to evangelize and disciple young people. Some of those young people give their lives to serve the Lord uh, and want to prepare to be missionaries. And so we have a missionary training institute uh, where we're training Brazilian young people to be missionaries to their own people and also to all the nations of the world. We believe Brazil is going to have a major impact on the world of missions around the world. And God is using the graduates of our school uh, all over Brazil and all over the world. We're excited to see what God is doing through the Missionary Training Institute. Uh, we train them not only in Bible and theology and, and missiology and all of those ologies, uh, but we also uh, teach them... Uh, uh, basic first aid, uh, how to fix motors, how to, how to plant gardens, how to teach adults how to read, uh, different uh, practical things that they'll need, sanitation and water supply, uh, uh, electricity, uh, so that when they get out into communities, they're not only able to survive in an environment like the Amazon, uh, but they're also able to serve the communities more effectively where they go. Uh, and then that feeds into the boat ministry, uh, which is a church planting ministry on the Amazon, uh, where graduates of our school uh, go out and start churches uh, in these communities. Uh, we begin by evangelizing, and then eventually we send a team of missionaries to live in a community. They plant a church there, and then the cycle repeats itself because all of those churches uh, have young people. And those young people need ministries. And so we're doing the, the camps on the river. And we have a floating seminary where we're training those young people to be leaders in their own community. And then they're multiplying and going on uh, and uh, planning new churches. And the cycle starts over. So the Amazon Project is a youth ministry that feeds into a missionary training institute that feeds into a church planning ministry that then starts over and begins the process all over again. So uh, that's what we're doing. And uh, the Lord is blessed in the last several years uh, in an amazing way. Uh, we have a magazine called the Amazon Project. Uh, there's three words on the front, reach, train, send. In three words, that's what the Amazon Project is. It's reaching people, it's training them, and sending them out as missionaries. If you'd like more information on the Amazon Project, please pick up a magazine uh, and it has uh, some stories about our history, what the Lord has done, uh, our philosophy of ministry and so forth. So please uh, avail yourself to one of those and, and read that. While we are here in the States, um, we uh, are doing a project to expand our cafeteria. Uh, we currently have 400 beds on our campus. Uh, our cafeteria holds about 150 people. So we're expanding our cafeteria from 150 to 400. It's a $100,000 project, which is a lot of money, but when you divide $100,000 by 400, the number is $250. So what we're praying for is 200 or 400 people to give $250 uh, for our cafeteria expansion. There's a blue envelope uh, that has all the information you need for that, and then there's some, some funny-looking plastic chairs there. Now, these chairs cost me 35 cents, okay? They cost you $250, all right? Uh, what we'd like for you to do is, is pick up a chair and put this chair in a place where you pray. And uh, when you see this chair, uh, remember to pray for the uh, student uh, that is studying at the Bible Institute that, that is using your chair. Pray they won't be distracted. Pray they'll study hard uh, and that they'll focus on uh, preparing to be a missionary to take the gospel where it's never gone before. Uh, 
January and July is our camping season, so pray for the camper who is using your chair, that they'll make a decision to trust Christ, or if they are believers, that they'll make consecration decisions uh, while they're at camp. So if you'd like to be a part of the cafeteria expansion project, that blue envelope has all that information. Pick up a chair. You can take as many chairs as you want. Uh, you're not limited to what well, you buy one for each one, one of your family members. Uh, but uh, please pray for that ministry. And uh, we uh, thank you for the opportunity to share it with you. Uh, so, so the strategy is to reach, is to train, and it's to send. It looks good on a magazine cover. It looks okay on a PowerPoint. But probably in your mind you're saying, does this really work? Uh, and so I'd like to just show you a quick video uh, that has some testimonies of people who have been impacted by the ministry. And then we'll turn to God's word. I'm Renan Olimpio, I'm from Abacaxi village, a small village in, in the middle of the Amazon. Everything started when I saw Mr. Richard Parker, when he came the first time uh, to my house and invited all the kids to go with him and listen to a Bible story. And I think that was the first time I really heard something about God. In 1996, when I came to camp for the first time, I also made my decision that way. So that week of camp was very important for me because I began my personal walk with Christ. I came to know Christ through a missionary named Richard, who came all the way to my community and spoke about Jesus Christ. And I was one of the first to accept Jesus Christ. I got in a floating seminary and that's when I began to learn more and then I decided I didn't just want to learn, but I want to share. The impact of Wood of Life ministry in my life is really huge because it was through that ministry that I could be evangelized, I could be reached, I could be trained, and I could be sent. There are still many people that need to hear the gospel. And I want to do this because one day someone left from so far away, left their home and their country to come to where I lived and told me about Jesus Christ. So all of this is a part of the Word of Life package. To think about it as a cycle. A person comes to know Christ, the person is trained and the person is sent. This what happened in my life. When I was on a camper who met Christ here, I was trained for ministry here, and now I work here, but Christ could use me anywhere. I think that is the importance of thinking of a ministry that doesn't just happen, or there's a program just to do it, but that has a philosophy behind it all. When you see villages transforming, when you see people giving their hearts to God and then seeing the transformation that He makes in those lives and seeing them want to reach other people and do what you do, uh, when you start seeing grandchildren of the ministry where people you have won to the Lord or have won other people to the Lord, that's probably the most rewarding thing of working on the river. Places that were lost in darkness, that were enslaved to sin, have been set free by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and are going out and spreading the gospel to other people. That's to the Amazon Project and we pray that God will continue to use it for many years to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Amazon for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. that exciting? Seeing the lives of people changed and then going out and changing the lives of other people. Uh, please visit our display table. We do have a sign-up sheet for our prayer letter. We send that out by email. Give us your email. We'd love to keep you abreast to let you know how you can pray for the uh, ministry of the Amazon Project uh, more effectively. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> let me ask you, 
go ahead and advance. Um, <clears throat> how, how many of you believe that uh, regular physical exercise is important for maintaining good health? Okay. Uh, how many of you exercise regularly? <laughs> few, few fewer hands, right? You know, uh, we all understand that regular physical exercise is good for us. Our doctor tells us we should do it. We know we ought to do it. But when it comes right down to it, our couches are a little bit more comfortable. And, and, and typically, <laughs> typically it takes something uh, to move us out of the couch and, and onto the treadmill, right? Um, something, it, it could be something as scary as stepping on your bathroom scale and not liking the number you see, right? Uh, or you go to your closet and suddenly all of your clothes, they just shrunk. Uh, the clothes just shrunk overnight. Um, or maybe it's something more serious and you go to your doctor and they say, okay, you can either go from your couch to the treadmill or you can go from the couch to my operating table, I'll open your heart, you know, and we'll, we'll take that cholesterol out of there. And you say, well, I think the treadmill, as scary as it seems, will probably be a little bit better than that operating table. And so that moves you to get up and get off the couch and move to the treadmill. Now, I'm not here this morning to promote physical exercise. I think it's a good idea. Don't get me wrong. But there's a lot of things in life that we know we ought to do. We know we should do them, but sometimes we just don't do them. And so one of those things is telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and we know as believers in Christ, since we have been saved from our sins, um, we know, we understand uh, that we should tell others about what Christ has done in our life, right? Uh, we know we should tell people about Jesus, Maybe we've even taken a course on how to tell others about Jesus. Uh, the problem is we just don't tell others about Jesus, okay? So, so why should we tell others about Jesus? What, what, what are the motives that, that make us tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I think we would agree this morning that maybe the Apostle Paul is probably one of the best Christians to have ever lived, right? Right? Uh, he was certainly one of the most effective missionaries. Uh, and, and, and we look at the way the Apostle Paul lived his life, the way he ordered his life. We'll say, I think he did okay, right? Uh, so what I'd like to do this morning is uh, look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, and in this passage, we're going to be looking uh, at the motives behind Paul's mission. What made Paul tick? What made Paul do what he did? What made Paul sacrifice so much, live in such a way that he was constantly telling other people about the Lord Jesus Christ? And, and my hope is that as we understand Paul's motives, the motives behind Paul's missions, that that will motivate you as well uh, to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so we're going to be... Uh, having a glimpse into Paul's motives as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, we'll begin read, reading in verse 11. Paul says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. What we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. We'll stop there for now. So I believe that Paul's first motive, the first motive behind Paul's mission is the fear of the Lord. Uh, as Paul looks at the, at, at the future, uh, he says the, the fear of the Lord, knowing the fear of the Lord, we, we persuade men. What is Paul talking about the, the fear of the Lord here? If we go back just a couple verses and look in verse, at verse uh, 9, it says, For whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Okay? So when Paul is talking about, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, he has just talked about the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? And so he says, I know that one day I'm going to stand before Christ, and therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. So, so the fear of, of the judgment seat of Christ uh, was a motive for Paul to share the gospel to others. So we're not always real comfortable with the idea of the fear of the Lord. What, what is the fear of the Lord, right? Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is simply the ability to live well. So here's what you need to know about the fear of the Lord. If you have the fear of the Lord, it will help you to live well, right? Uh, but here's what Paul is talking about in this passage. He's saying the fear of the Lord will also help you be able to die well, okay? When we die, when this world is over for us, every one of us as believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We will be before the judgment seat of Christ and we will have to give an account for how we have lived our lives in this world. Now when we think of the fear of the Lord, sometimes we get a little bit uncomfortable about that because I don't think we understand the fear of the Lord quite correctly. So when I think of the fear of the Lord... I try to think of the fear of the Lord like newlyweds, okay? So, so let's imagine a couple, newly married. They've, the ceremony's over. The honeymoon is over. And for the first time, he goes to work, okay? And then when he's done with work, he comes home. Now, now the new bride is at home making her very first meal for her husband, okay? And, uh, and so he sits down at the table, and she puts that first meal on the table, and he, they, they, they pray for the Parkers, you know, at the table, and uh, then they, then they uh, you know, he, he takes that first, first bite, and, and he puts it in his mouth, frees the film, look at her face, and there you see the fear of the Lord. Okay. Um, now he chews it up and manages to swallow it. And she says, darling, how was it? Now you look on his face and you see the fear of the Lord. Okay. So, so now she's not worried that he's going to taste that food and say, how could you make something so terrible? This is trash. I'm going back to mama, okay? At this point of the marriage, that's not what they're worried about, okay? And, and she's not, or he's not worried that if, if he says, well, honey, I think it's a teaspoon of salt, not a tablespoon of salt. There's a difference between those two teas. Um, <clears throat> She's not worried that he's going to say, you don't, you know, she's going to say, you don't care for me, you don't love me, you don't like my cooking, I'm going back to my daddy, okay? At this point of the marriage, that's not what's happening here, okay? What's happening is exactly what we see happening in Paul's life. Remember what he says, we make it our aim, whether, whether here, whether there, wherever we are, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him, to be pleasing to him. Now, she just wants to please her husband with her food. And he just wants to please his wife with his words. And be able to keep his Christianity at the same time. Okay? And, so, and so, so they're looking for ways the desire of their heart is to please one another. That's what the fear of the Lord is. It's a burning desire in your heart to please the Lord. I want to be pleasing to the Lord. So when you think of the judgment seat of Christ, and, and I want to talk a little bit about the judgment seat of Christ here, uh, there's some things you need to know uh, about the, how, how the judgment seat of Christ will work. Okay, So Paul has taught extensively about the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4. 
Uh, but what we need to know about the judgment seat is, first of all, it's an examination of believers, okay? Only believers will be at the judgment seat of Christ. This is not a time to decide who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, okay? If you're at the judgment seat of Christ, you're already in heaven, okay? It's an examination of believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says that our works will go through fire. If they're gold, silver, precious stones... Uh, they will be purified and they will result in reward, okay? If they're wood, hay, or stubble, those works will be burned up, but he himself will be saved, though as through fire. So they're saved, they're in heaven, they just smell like smoke, okay? And so what Paul is saying, I don't want to be in heaven smelling like smoke, okay? I don't want to go through that. I want to be richly rewarded in heaven, okay? Um, and, and so what the judgment seat of Christ is, is it reveals the motives of our heart. It reveals our faithfulness as servants of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says, Let a man consider us as stewards of the gospel, servants of Christ and stewards of the gospel. What is required of a steward is that he be found faithful. And then he goes on to talk about it revealing the motives and intents of our hearts. So the judgment seat of Christ will reveal, reveal the motives of your heart and your faithfulness. Now I think that that's good and that's important, okay? Because anytime we think about judgment, anytime we think about any of this stuff, we're always, we're always thinking about comparisons, right? So Okay, who here wants to volunteer to be judged right after the Apostle Paul, right? Okay, so the Apostle Paul goes in there, he's being judged, he comes out with semi-loads semi of crowns, right? Okay, and then you're next, right? You have to go right after the Apostle Paul, you're going, oh boy, here we go, right? Uh, that's kind of how we look at the judgment seat, we're saying, you know, how's this going to work? Um, Paul had unique opportunities in his life. He had unique gifts. He lived at a historical time. Uh, God used him in an incredible way, and he was very faithful to use his gifts, his abilities, his opportunities to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Paul looked at his life, he said, you know, I want to live my life to honor Jesus. All right? And I, I, I want to use all of my talents uh, to, to further the kingdom of God. And he said, I, I want to use all of my time. I, I don't know how Paul had a sundial or how Paul told time, but Paul, Paul wanted to use his time in the best way possible to be faithful to use his time to serve the Lord. He wanted to use his treasure. He wanted to use how, however, whatever resources he had, he wanted to use in the best way possible. And so Paul wanted to use his talent, his time, and his treasures faithfully. And that's what God requires of you. Okay? We all, all have different talents. You will not be judged according to the Apostle Paul's talents. Or my talents. Or your pastor's talents. Or, or Wendell's talents. You will be judged according to your talents. Okay? Uh, and your treasure. Uh, in your time and in, in the opportunities that you have, every one of us are only required to be faithful with what has been given to us. That may be a lot, that might be a little. What's required of you is faithfulness to whatever you have, okay? Uh, and it will determine those eternal rewards, what we will get for, for all of eternity. And, and sometimes people have a hard time thinking of being motivated by eternal rewards, okay? Uh, and, and it almost sounds a little bit selfish, doesn't it? Say, well, is it right to be motivated for eternal rewards? Well, if you think that way, let me try to convince you differently, okay? First of all, Jesus used eternal rewards over and over and over again in his teaching, right? Okay? Think of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, don't pray in public, because if you pray in public to be seen of men, you already have your reward. 
pray in private so that God who sees in private will reward. So praying and fasting and giving are all things that Jesus talks about. Don't do them in public to be seen by men. Do them in private so that God will reward you. Okay, Jesus is using eternal rewards for that. Paul here and in many other passages uses eternal rewards as motivation. I'm thinking if Jesus did it and Paul did it, I'm okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> Here's another thing you need to understand about eternal rewards. Okay? Eternal rewards is all about demonstrating the glory of Jesus. Okay? It's not like we're going to be going around heaven like an NFL player who just scored a touchdown. Going, yeah, I got a crown. You know, spiking it on the ground. Okay? That, that's not how we're going to act in heaven. Okay? It's, it's all going to be about laying those crowns at Jesus' feet and honoring and glorifying him. All right? So what I want you to understand is that how you view eternal rewards tells me a lot about how you view God. All right? How you view eternal rewards has a lot to do with how you view God. Let me illustrate it like this. Let's say that I go to McKinsey when she's a little girl, and I say, McKinsey, if you study hard and get good grades at the end of the year, Daddy is going to give you a reward. Okay? Now, McKinsey has a choice to make. She has a choice to make as to whether she's going to buckle down and study hard or whether she's just going to skate through school and go playing or do whatever. She will base that reward on what she thinks of me. Okay? Because if she goes, my dad is a missionary. He doesn't have very much money. I'm going to study all year long, work all year long. My daddy's a cheapskate. Okay? At the end of the year, he's probably going to take me for a happy meal, okay? I, I'm not going to study hard all year long to get a stinking happy meal, okay? But if she says, wait a minute, my daddy gives me a, is going to give me a reward. I don't know what it's going to be, but I know my daddy. And if he promises a reward, even though he's a missionary, he's going to do something. I bet he's going to give me a, um, an, I, an iPod or an iPhone or a, an iPad or an iBook. Something with an I in it, okay? Uh, if she's a little older, she goes, maybe, maybe it's like graduating from, maybe I'm going to get a, a car, you know? Think, Man, I better study hard because even though my dad is a missionary, He's going to give great rewards. So your attitude about eternal rewards, you don't know what they are. I don't really know exactly what they are, but they tell me a lot about what you view about God. Do you believe God is a cheapskate? Do you, you believe you're going to go to heaven and say, oh, I worked so hard for the kingdom and all I got was this? Do you think that about God? No, I promise you, when you stand before God and he gives you those eternal rewards, you're going to be going, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. This is, this is beyond any imagining why in the world did I put so few values on this. And I believe that our eternal rewards have a lot to do with our abilities and opportunities to serve and honor and glorify God for all of eternity. I don't really know a whole lot about what those rewards will be or what suffering loss in heaven would look like. But I just know that if God promises them, I want to. Okay? And you want to. So knowing the fear of the Lord 
we persuade men. See, a lot of times we, we don't share about Christ because we're afraid of what other people will think of us, right? And, and what you need to know is, is whether you will live your life fearing the Lord or fearing men. This is what God says. He says, I want, I want you to have faith. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And this is what he says in Hebrews. He says, um, those who have faith must believe two things, that God is and that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God wants to be known as a rewarder. He wants you to see him as a rewarder. Those rewards are great. Do you believe it even though you can't see it? Okay. And so you have to decide this morning whether you will live according to the fear of the Lord or the fear of men. Worrying about what other people think of you when you share Christ with them or worried about what the Lord's think of you when you share the, about Christ with others. And Paul seems to be worried about that in this passage. He, he says, you know, uh, some people look at outward appearances. Other people look at the heart. I, I want you to know about us that, that if, we are, if we are crazy, we are crazy for God. People thought Paul was crazy for living the life that he lived. And he said, you know what? I really don't care what people think of me. I care about what God thinks of me. And so this morning, we will either be motivated by the fear of men, what others think of us when we share Christ with them, or we'll be motivated by the fear of the Lord and living for these eternal rewards. Believe it or not, I still have more. Let's go on. Did you hear him say that I came a long ways away and I could have as long as I wanted? Okay. I don't believe your pastor's lying. Okay. So let's move. Okay. Uh, let's go look at verse 14. He said, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him for whose sake he died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. All is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the mystery of reconciliation. That is God, Christ, that is, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Now, this is a big, a big passage, a lot of rich truth. I don't have time to explain it all to you, but here's what I want you to know. Okay, The second motive was for Paul was the love of Christ on the cross. Okay, The, the, first, the first look, he's looking to the future and the judgment seat of Christ. In the second motive, he's looking at the past. He's looking at the cross of Christ. He says, the love of Christ in the past, it constrains me. It moves me. As I consider that Christ died for me, he gave his life for me. His love that he demonstrated on the cross, it compels me. It moves me. It changes me. And so as Paul considers the death of Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, he says, the love of Christ is what compels me. The love of Christ is what moves me. The gospel has changed my life. The gospel changes everything. And so we see here that, that Paul's view of death was radically transformed by the gospel. <laughs> he said, I'm not afraid to die. <laughs> We don't need to be afraid to die because of, because of the gospel. We know when we die, a, a brother did, that died this week, the pastor says, that's great news. <laughs> it's great news because we know that if we're in Christ and we die, uh, we're, we're in heaven. My father-in-law passed away earlier this year. It's the same thing. We said, praise the Lord. <laughs> um, he, he was suffering in a, in a broken body. And when the Lord promotes people to heaven, 
It's a glorious thing. Well, it's the gospel that changes that perspective. Well, the gospel changes how we live. We no longer live for ourselves. We live for him who died for me. He died for me so that I could live for him. The gospel must change the way that we live. The gospel changes the way we view others. He said, we no longer judge people according to the flesh. Okay? We no longer judge people according to the flesh. Now, in Paul's day, in Paul's day, um, <laughs> in Paul's day, uh, everybody was judged as to whether they were Jews or whether they were Gentiles. No, we need to go back, okay? <laughs> All right, whether they were Jews or whether they were Gentiles. If they were Jews, they were considered to be God's people. If they were Gentiles, they were considered to be kindling for hell, okay? In Paul's day, everybody was judged in that way. Paul says, I no longer judge others according to the flesh. My view of others has changed because of the gospel. I no longer judge people as to whether they're Jews or whether they're Gentiles. They're all one in Christ. Let me tell you this morning, there is no room in the body of Christ for prejudice. Okay? Jesus loves and died for everyone. It doesn't matter if they are black or white or what color they are, what language they speak, what nation where they're from. It doesn't matter if they're Democrats or Republicans, okay? Jesus died for them all. He loves them all. He died. The gospel changes how we view people. It changes our politics. Now, we have an immigration problem in this country. It's called an immigration problem, right? Now, I don't want to... I don't want to make any political statements here. You know, we built a wall around our campus. I understand the need to protect our borders. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this, okay? We have immigrants coming into our country. Our first impulse as believers in Jesus Christ must not be our security and our protection. Our first impulse must be be their salvation. We need to love them to Jesus. We need to lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ, show them the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, show them the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then send them back as missionaries to their own people. Amen? Okay? I, I'm not a politician. I'm not a policeman. I'm a preacher. And I understand that my first priority for anybody no matter their color, no matter their race, no matter their gender, no matter their nationality, no matter their status in this country, is to love them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Because the gospel changes our view of people. The gospel changes our view of Jesus. The gospel is a change of a view about Jesus. Now, this morning, you have three options concerning Jesus, okay? A lot of people say Jesus was a great man. He was a great man, but he wasn't just a great man, okay? Others will say that Jesus was a, was a wonderful moral example. And he was a wonderful moral example, but that's not all he was, because he claimed to be God. He claims to be God. Now, you don't have the option this morning of saying that he was a great man and a wonderful moral example if you don't also claim that he is God. <laughs> because he claimed to be God. <laughs> and someone who claims to be God and is not God is not a great man. He's a crazy man, okay? Someone who claims to be God and is not God is not a moral example. He's a liar. Okay? So this morning, you can either pity Jesus as a crazy man, as a lunatic. You can hate him because he's a liar. Or you can worship him because he's your Lord. Okay? 
Those are your three choices about Jesus. Those are the three choices that Jesus offers you this morning. You can pity him, you can hate him, or you can worship him. Because he is Savior, he is Lord of Lords, he is King of Kings. And he demands your worship this morning. And, and the gospel changes your view of Jesus. And therefore it changes our view, uh, our, our relationship with God. Be, because of God, because of our relationship with Christ and the gospel, we are no longer this old creation. We are new creatures in Christ. <laughs> The, the old has passed away, the new has come. We have been changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He transforms us. He changes us. Is he changing you? He, he transforms also our responsibilities to man. We have been reconciled to God. We have been joined with God. We have become new creatures. And then he entrusts to us the message of reconciliation. Isn't that incredible? God takes you, a sinner, and by his love and grace through the gospel, he saves you. And he makes you a saint in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he entrusts to you the message of reconciliation so that you can be an instrument of, of reconciliation for other people. You can, you can share Christ with others. God took you from a sinner, he made you a saint, and then you made, he made you a servant of the Most High God. Only God can do that. Only that is possible through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I ask, how has God changed you? <laughs> what is God doing to change your life? Is the love of Christ demonstrated on the cross, has it changed your mind, your life, the way you look and think about things? The gospel is here to change you, to transform you, to save you from your sin and make you whole again. He died for you. He loves you. And through Christ, you can be reconciled to God this morning. And your life can be transformed. And you can be made into a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, Paul says here, he says in verse 20, he says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Paul's third motive is the call of God. In the present. <laughs> uh, we've seen the, the future and the judgment seat of Christ and the fear of God in the future. And we, we see the love of Christ in the past on the cross. And, and now Paul says, therefore, I'm looking at my present. What, what do I do? Well, I have a call of God on my life. I have an invitation from him to represent him, to be an ambassador. That's what an ambassador does. What, what does an ambassador do? <laughs> okay. An ambassador, first and foremost, what, does it, what is an ambassador called to do? Well, the first thing he's called to do is he's called to practice the values of his kingdom. Okay? He's called to practice the values of his nation. When we send an ambassador to a foreign country, we expect him to practice our values, our values of freedom and liberty. God expects you in this country, in this life that you're living, in your home, in your family, in your school, in your place of work, he expects you to practice the values of his kingdom. You're an ambassador. You're his representative there. He, he has called you to be pure. He has called you to be holy. Uh, he has called you to be faithful. He has called you to be loyal. He has called you to be joyful. He has called you to rejoice. That's one of our values, right? So, sometimes it looks like Christians have been sucking lemons all the time, doesn't it? Just walk around... Be holy. And, and, and the way we act and treat people, it's like we're angry and upset the whole... That's not a value of our kingdom. I, I think Christians ought to be the best hummers and whistlers on the planet. Okay? I, I think we ought to be walking around all the time. You know, I'm so happy and here's the reason why. 
Jesus took my burdens all away. You know, and that, that song just, just humming and singing and, and whistling in our mind. And people go, what's wrong with you? Don't you know this world is messed up? Yeah, it's messed up, but I'm not of this world. I'm just in it. Okay? <laughs> Jesus took my burdens all away. I can't stop humming and whistling. You start humming and whistling, people come up to you and say, what's wrong with you? You say, well, Jesus is what's wrong with me. And I know where you can find him. Come to Cornerstone Baptist Church. It's just full of hummers and whistlers, right? Those are the values of our kingdom. We need to represent those values in this world. Uh, but we also proclaim the message of the kingdom. An ambassador just doesn't live the values. He proclaims the message. He makes speeches. He says, our country is the greatest country. Well, as believers, we need to proclaim the message of the kingdom. We have been entrusted with a message of reconciliation for the world. Those who are separated from God can be reconciled to them through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That message has been entrusted to you. And you have been called by God, very God. To proclaim that message to a lost and dying world. That is God's call on your life for the present. And he says, knowing this. He said, we, what does it say? We persuade men. In this passage, he said, he says, we are making our appeal. We implore you. We implore you. Be reconciled to God. Paul was all about persuading men. You know, sometimes when we share Christ with people, we just say, you know, Jesus died for your sin. He loves you. And you can, you can put your faith and trust in him if you want to. Okay. That's not a very good ambassador. Okay. An ambassador persuades men and says, listen, my friend, you, you are in a desperately dangerous situation right now. You stand condemned before God for all of eternity. But Jesus loves you. He died for you. I'm imploring with you. Be reconciled to God. You, you can't be saved through your religion. You can't be saved through your works. You can't be saved through any of that. The only way you can be saved is through Jesus Christ. I implore you. I beg you. I'm here trying to persuade you. This morning be reconciled to God. And sometimes when we talk about Jesus, it's like we're lying. You know, Jesus is really good. He loves you a lot. That's not persuading men. You're saying something that's true, but you're, you're acting like it's a lie. Okay? And, and Paul says we are called to be his ambassador. And boldly proclaim him wherever we go. That's God's call on your life. You, you have the privilege of representing God, very God, in this world in your place of work, in your school, in your home, in your family. This Thanksgiving, you're going to be sitting down. Probably you're going to have some relatives. Probably relatives that aren't blood believers. You know, how are you going to represent him this Thanksgiving between, before those people? Passionately with, with the love of Christ just oozing from you, the joy of Christ just oozing from you. And you say, man, I, I need what they have. How can I give it? I want you to challenge you this week to, to represent our Lord well because it's God's call on your life. How are you representing Jesus in your home, your school, your place of work, around the Thanksgiving table today? Folks, God, is, God has given us three motives this morning for, for sharing Christ with others. We've, we've seen uh, the fear of the Lord in the future as we look at standing before the judgment seat of Christ, uh, the fear of God in the future, uh, uh, of knowing that we will have to give an account. But we've we all seen the, seen the love of Christ in the past and how he died and he gave his son. And, and that has given us a call of God in the present to represent him wherever we go. That's what made Paul do what he did. That's what made Paul willing to, to live his life the way he lived his life. I, I pray this morning that these motives will, will bring change into your heart as, as you do understand that, that one day you will stand before Christ and you will give an account. Uh, I, I, I hope this morning that you've remembered the, the grace of God, the love of God, 
through Christ demonstrated on the cross and, and that his love would just, just flow through you and change you and transform you so you can passionately represent him where he has you in the world. May God strengthen you and bless you in that task. Father, we thank you for your word. We're thankful for the example of Paul. And we pray that these things will be true and real in, your, your life, in our lives as we seek to represent you well, as we respond to your incredible love in our life, and as we anticipate that day when we will gloriously be in your presence and receive rewards that really all belong to you. May you be honored and glorified and pleased by our life. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.